Batman the Caped Crusader is like having a really good crab cake. Really well seasoned. Tastes great. But then afterwards you kind of realize that it felt like imitation crab. And later you find out that there was not the whole cake, but a portion of it was in fact using imitation crab as part of their ingredients. And you can't help but feel just a little disappointed and let down. Me and the fiance managed to attend the Batman Cape Crusader panel over at Comic Con in which they actually screened the first episode. And at the time, I didn't know if I wanted to do a full-blown video on just one episode or if I wanted to wait until they dropped all these episodes, which in fact they did. But circumstances also kind of got in the way as far as like life, expenses, me trying to figure things out, scheduling with me and the fiance. And so since we both decided to make that one of our shows, one of our couple shows, it took a little bit of a while to finish the entire season. And by the time that we did in fact finish, I thought of myself a very straightforward review like the ones that have already been up on YouTube for a number of, of days, even weeks at this point, was not really going to be very viable. But I thought, what's something that really stuck out to me out of the season that really kind of exemplifies why I felt kind of let down by Batman Cape Crusader? And out of all the characters that really kind of embodied my feelings was Harvey Dent, a.k.a. Two-Face. And it kind of also transcended into this message to me as to why it is that I feel like Caped Crusader failed one of its greatest rogue gallery villains, Harvey Two-Face. First, I want to get like some of the technical stuff out of the way, some of the things that I feel like we can all kind of uh, objectively agree, whether it be from walking out of that first episode that I saw at Comic-Con and I felt about it the same exact way then that I felt about it at the end of the season when me and the fiancé finally wrapped it all up, was that the animation is still on point. They did not spare any expense. In fact, I would say that Prime was able to put a little bit of extra budget into what they were kind of allocating for the animation a bit more than their other animated show, Invincible. I'm sorry, but I feel like in terms of like frame rate and shading and I don't know, whatever talent they had behind the animation team, they really nailed it as far as not only the character designs, I really liked the aesthetic of the 60s, then mixing that with some of the more modernized stuff, the way that the animated series really did, where you couldn't, couldn't really tell if it took place in the 90s because you had some of the high-tech stuff that Batman was dealing with and utilizing to you know do his Batman stuff. But at the same time, you had this Art Deco kind of approach to the aesthetic of Gotham, the cars, the outfits, the style, everything, just the whole entire approach. And Kid Crusader is no different, except it just kind of zeroes in a little bit more on the 60s, more so than maybe the animated series did for like the 40s or the 50s and so that blend of aesthetic is actually really done well here as far as the animation the way that they were able to strike the tone I just wish that a little bit could be said about the music I didn't feel like the music was iconic as it was in the animated series and I know that some of you are probably thinking well yeah they used the Danny Elfman score of course but come on show some respect for the goat Shirley Walker who took some like inspiration of the Danny Elfman theme but when you really think about it the Elfman theme is only really in the title sequence or in the opening you know sequence the intro outside of that she came up with her own themes and she nailed the vibe while at the same time coming up with something very unique for the animated series that when you hear the da, 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 like that that kind of like jingle you think of animated series. You don't think of Keaton Batman when you think dun, 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 dun. then that's, you know, Elfman, that's Keaton, that's Burton. But when you hear that first one, you think of animated series. You think of Conroy. You think of him telling off his, uh, the illusion of his father telling him that he's a failure to screw off. And he's like, I am the knight. And you think of that sequence, it sends down chills down my spine. So it's a little bit of a bummer that the music here, it did the job as far as hitting the right cues, but for like the title sequence where they just take clips from the show and just make them out black and white and this theme is it just didn't really resonate as well as it could have so that's a little bit of a of a bummer to kind of ha have that and like i said before all that aside i really do like the presentation of the show even if it means that there are some design choices that are a little bit on the questionable side again this is probably the only time i'm going to mention this but Apart from the actual art style of taking things from the 60s, there's still some little 
creative choices that I at most raised my eyebrow to. If you've been on the internet long enough for the past couple of years, you know exactly what I am talking about. Again, I'm not going to go as far as to go on a tirade on Twitter. I'm not going to boycott the show. I'm actually still down. Spoilers, by the way. I'm still down for a season two. But there were little moments kind of sewn in throughout the design template of this show that I couldn't help but kind of... I couldn't ignore. I really could not kind of look away from. And when I saw it, I'm like... I started to kind of gamble with myself as like a little bingo game. I'm like, this character is designed this way, so chances are that character is probably going to be a bad guy. Yeah, he turned out to be a bad guy. Oh, uh, there you go. Spoilers. He. But again, I kind of told myself, let's not let that ruin my immersion of the show, my enjoyment of the show, or whatever I am trying to extrapolate from the show, from the series. And so I took it and just kind of pushed it off to the side. And I was, in doing so, being able to... Note another thing that I really liked about this show that I think was handled very well was, was Easter eggs. As far as calling back to the mythology and the legacy of Batman while at the same time not feeling the need to cram everything in there. There's something very nuanced about the way that Cape Crusader was able to handle some of these Easter eggs. As far as name drops, little things in the background, things that maybe even don't have to do with the mythology of Batman. It's really more so like a callback to... Just people that were involved in the making of some of these shows or movies or things like that. So that was pretty cool. And overall, as far as like the big picture of watching this entire thing play out from beginning to end, it's really paced very well as far as not having any episode feel terribly like filler. You still have kind of like this through line being carried from beginning to end as far as the corruption happening in Gotham. Batman and the crew trying to weed out this corruption while at the same time realizing that sometimes... That corruption is just too big for them to handle and all they could do is just weather the storm. So it's cool that that theme, that through line is still held. Even if there are going to be those episodes where you have your case of the week or your villain of the week. Some of these villains are just resorted to just being bottled in singular episodes. And ever so often that template did kind of worry me. But at least it was treated, like I said, for the most part really well with nuance. And what was really able to sell some of these villains of the week was also the performances and the way that they were written as far as... Having something be a little bit on the fantastical side while at the same time striking this delicate balance of something that I know would probably be weird in live action. But then the way that it's written within the context of an animated show, I'm like, it's done. Just like the animated series. Stuff that has to do a little bit with the supernatural, a little bit with the crazy as far as something that's just, you just kind of have to accept for, for what it is. Even if at times you hear the voice telling, you think, oh my god, some of these people are just top-notch ta talent across the board, especially our main four. Hamish Linklater as Batman. I gotta be honest, I think he's probably up there with Conroy. I don't think he tops Conroy. Conroy is still number one, the greatest of all time. I'm not even gonna call him the GOAT, the greatest of all time. But at the same time, he, he Hamish Linklater, I gotta be honest, he's probably within top five material for sure. But then everybody else over on the side is also still doing a really good job as far as just selling me on these characters as far as the voice actors and actresses who play Gordon, Barbara, Montoya, uh, Flash, Bullock, which is played by John DiMaggio coming back again. And you can recognize that it's DiMaggio almost right off the bat, but then after you watch a few episodes, you kind of it kind of sinks into you and he kind of dis I don't want to say disappears. You still think it's DiMaggio, but it fits for a character like Bullock. When you hear his voice, you think of a character like Bullock, you're like, yeah, it kind of makes sense. It's just that ever so often, these people are so strong that when you bring in someone who could be as strong and only use them for like either one or two episodes, you're like, why? You know, you I feel like you kind of wasted them a little bit. Mini Driver as a female, as Walda Cobblepot, who I did like as Cobblepot. I actually did like this version of the character. But why Mini Driver? She's an Oscar-nominated actress. Spoilers, she's in that first episode that they screened for us at Comic-Con. And I was thinking to myself, maybe she'll break out of a black gate or there's going to be something that she's involved with as far as her connection to the mob. No, she's, she, she's gone. No, she's literally in that one episode. Why was she? I'm sorry. I like Minnie Driver. Why was she even the panelist over at Comic-Con if she was literally in just one episode? I just do not understand. And I guess while we're on the subject of, you know, why certain people are in it, the way that they are and how much screen time they really do have versus the talent that's behind them. 
I guess at this point we need to start moving in the direction of looking at that elephant in the room and starting our addresses. Why call the show Batman Caped Crusader if Batman is barely f***ing in it? Yeah, I mean, I'm sorry. I don't know how else to possibly slice this, but it's called Batman Caped Crusader, and I'm pretty certain that if I was to go through the trouble of setting up a stopwatch on my phone and count exactly how much screen time Batman has in this first season versus all the other supporting characters, he's going to be dwarfed. And I know that the very huge argument here is we already have so much Batman, it's time to focus on those characters. All right, cool. Then give them their show, which we kind of had with Gotham, and there was potential there. But after I gave that show a chance, I think I, I think I kept watching that show until like season three or four, and I was like, ah, I'm done. You know, there it's nothing is doing it for me. And I gave that show a chance because I, I for a while I genuinely did want like a Smallville type of show for the world of Gotham and Batman that wasn't focused on Batman. Where Batman, yeah, was a kid, but the, you know he just got traumatized with his parents' murder. What is Gordon doing to try to rise up to that reputation that he had as becoming lieutenant or commissioner? So that didn't work. It's been a little bit of a while since we had a Batman-focused show. We had the Harley Quinn show, which recently I hear I haven't watched it, but I hear it's actually pretty good. And Batman guest stars in it, but that's okay because it's called the Harley Quinn show, so Harley Quinn's going to be the main character. Awesome, and her pals, and occasionally Batman's going to poke his head in there because she's still in Gotham. Okay, that cool makes sense. That perfectly makes sense, and I like Kayla Coco. So here, having a show called Batman Cape Crusader, and these first batch of episodes, we're mostly fa focusing on Montoya. Barbara, Gordon, some of the corrupted cops, some of the secondary characters, hell, even uh, Harleen Quinzel and whatever she's got going on right there. I'm just like, what is going on? And then we get to the other character I'd focus on and ultimately Wace, which was where I was kind of anchoring this video, Harvey Dent. In the first couple of episodes, my impressions of Harvey Dent were pretty spot on and they were kind of checking all the boxes for what we were getting out of Harvey Dent. He was the DA, he was very popular, a lot of people liked him. He was a little smug and cocky, but he had very grand aspirations and those aspirations even stretched to becoming mayor of Gotham and wanting to kind of weed out the corruption. And that's what Harvey Dent was all about, being able to do a very balanced and unprejudiced and fair form of justice to kind of quote a little bit of the Dark Knight however unlike the Dark Knight this Harvey Dent is a major prick from scene one and that to me was the initial red flag that made me go uh oh I think we might be in trouble with this incarnation of Harvey Dent and I understand what their approach was was to take some pre-existing characters that we've seen time and time again and give them a brand new spin and for the most part an awful lot of these things did kind of in fact work it, like this version of Harleen Quinzel who is already kind of crazy prior to her interaction of Joker in fact Joker has nothing to do with her influence and frankly I kind of actually did dig that that she's got a little bit of a I don't want to say a BDSM thing going on but the way that she was kind of brainwashing the, the the patients again a little convenient as far as who those patients were but her approaches and the way that it was portrayed out the methodology if you will I actually did like as well as like I said this version of, of Cobblepied and how she was confident in her imagery being that now she's a female I'm like oh she's confident in her thickness I actually kind of dig that as opposed to the usual yeah, version of Penguin, like the Danny DeVito one, that I enjoy. So some of these wrinkles that they tossed over to these ca traditional characters you've seen time and time again, all right, I kind of, I did kind of dig, I was kind of having this sense of momentum, but the one that just did not vibe with me was Harvey Dent because from the outset, he's a prick, he's a, a jerk to Barbara, he's a jerk to like so many characters, and then furthermore, what really saddened me was that he was already willing, not maybe from the very beginning, but he was already having like talks and starting to plant things as far as her his connection to the mob to then become mayor in the long run. And I'm like, well, that's not what Harvey Dent is all about. And it's a shame because Daedric Bader, who actually does the voice for Harvey Dent, and he himself has played Batman in the past, He's done phenomenal job as Batman before, and here he really blended in as Harvey Dent. He felt like a different character, and so he's doing a good job with the material that he's given. It's just that it just soured this kind of feeling that I had for Harvey Dent that knowing that eventually he is going to fall into the madness of Two-Face 
I just told myself I'm really hoping that they're able to at least start to plant seeds to make him a redeemable character that so when that incident happens I will at least be able to feel for him because that's the theme behind Harvey Dent is that he's the white knight that you think is the legal way of going about justice versus the illegal way that Batman is doing it the way that those themes were tackled in the Dark Knight exquisitely and you would think that for a while there they were going to do that redeem him by having him throw that case that the mob was trying to tell him to, you know throw it except he doesn't do it and sure you could see this as his like moral compass but I feel like by then it's kind of too late. I felt kind of vacant watching him. So, this leading to his scarring with the acid, we were just kind of like, well, me and my fiance, we were just kind of like, there it is. It, it happened. There's there's our Two-Face. Now, I did kind of appreciate that they didn't go with the cliche, like he hears voices in his head and he's referring himself to we and us and, and things like that. It was a bit more on the... Um, Nuance, I know I go back to that word frequently, it's a little bit more level-headed, even though he was starting to lose it. But once they were trying to kind of develop his downward spiral of going into like depression, drinking during the day, his apartment's all thrown about, and he's become a bit of a recluse. Again, by that point, I had already felt nothing. I really did not feel nothing. And to add insult to injury, the one to come in and try to help him out is Bruce Wayne. The Bruce Wayne that we were barely seeing, the Bruce Wayne that we barely saw any kind of relationship with in Harvey Dent prior to any of these scenes. So when he comes in and says, you know, I thought, you know, maybe seeing an old friend will get you out. You know, let's go to a restaurant or whatever. It did not click with me whatsoever. I was like, did we ever see this kind of relationship? Did we see this thing bloom, grow, anything like that? No, there was nothing that told us that these guys were friends. Nothing. So when this is happening and he has his blowout at the restaurant, he takes off the gauze. It's a cool design from a visual standpoint as far as not going the full like it's red. You see bone like in the Dark Knight or even in some of the Arkham games. They did with something that's a bit more on the, um, like I said, 1960s, 1950s Boris Karloff kind of approach. Kind of like the, the way they did with uh, Clayface in the earlier part of the season. But again, by this point, any kind of emotional resonance, I just didn't feel any of that attached myself to, especially with Bruce Wayne's attempt to try to redeem him, even though it did feed into something that I did find kind of interesting, which is may not be in the most morally just way, which is that Bruce Wayne was trying to pull out information rather than actually genuinely being a friend. But I just wish that we could have been shown that a little bit more as to why it makes sense for, out of all the people out here, Bruce Wayne is the one that Harvey looked at and said, all right, fine, I'll try to go to the restaurant. Because right now, I just don't believe it. What I did believe were the versions that we saw in The Dark Knight and even in the animated series because I always interpreted Harvey Dent to be a tragic character. You have to watch this guy fall so that Batman can be like, whoa. I tried, I have to stick around and be the person that he maybe could have been, but still be the Dark Knight, and not necessarily the White Knight. And that's what those two properties, those two mediums were able to nail. You see the downfall of Harvey Dent, and you go, man, you're kind of kicking yourself going, you could have been that awesome guy. And for a little while, they were painting the picture that you were that awesome guy, except they had to mask it. No pun intended. But you see the tragedy uh, fall of like, he gets scarred, he loses someone that he loves, and he's like, well, I got nothing. This guy had nothing that he loved outside of maybe the justice system, you can make that argument. But again, he was just so smug and cocky and dickish that I'm like, smug. you can do smug and cocky, but you have to have something there for us to like. And I just didn't find anything to like. Whereas with Harvey Dent from The Dark Knight, he had Rachel, and you liked that chemistry. He was cocky, but you knew that he was trying to do things as applicable as possible. He had those meetings with Gordon in his office, you know, the use of the Mark Bills, and be like, okay, you know, I'll get my people, we'll, we'll coordinate, yada, yada, yada. He wasn't antagonizing towards Gordon. Hell, he wasn't even antagonizing towards Batman when he throws up the signal, and you have that 360 shot of the three of them with, awkward, with Batman just standing there awkwardly, like, watching his parents fight. But... 
that argument felt like a legit argument between partners. You knew that when they were arguing, they were arguing, but for a good cause, not for like egos. You never found any egos bashing. You generally saw an argument of methodologies, but for a common goal. Did I get that at all from this Harvey Dent? No. Did, hell, we got that even better from the animated series, especially when we get that iconic shot after his scarring when he walks out into the hospital hospital hallway and the lightning strikes and he kind of turns around like, what's happened to me? And who's waiting for him right there through, through the entire time? His wife or his girlfriend or his fiance? And boom, there's another love. There's another thing that he lost. And he's like, dude, I lost the case. I just lost my love. I just... What else is there? And that's the spiral. Whereas right here, that spiral, like I said, happens at such a breakneck pace that it's just it, it just kind of sucks out all the air of whatever kind of drama or whatever material there was here for making me for making me feel anything for this version of Harvey Dent. Not saying that there wasn't potential starting to be planted and sown here, because after this initial run with whatever was going on with him. There was like a glimmer of hope that maybe we can see that likable version of Harvey Dent. And maybe this was the twist on the character. Like the show was doing with plenty of other Rogue's Gallery villains they've seen traditionally. And they were adding their own wrinkles. Maybe the wrinkle here was that Harvey Dent Two-Face was actually going to be like an anti-hero. Not necessarily a villain that Batman has to catch over and over again. And he's often, you know, tossing the coin. Because for a little while there, it looked like he was a form of his own version of an uh, of an avenger just legitimately killing almost like a red hood type and i was like oh wait maybe there's something kind of cool going on right here you know he was doing the flippy with the coin he was asking the dude that was getting mugged like what do you think we should do with this guy i actually kind of really did like that and then later on his interactions with barbara and barbara wanting to be his lawyer i actually started to see just a little bit of flourishing of chemistry that i'm like yo can he really be an anti-hero and do th do things the wrong way for, but for the right reason well it's looking like all we're really going to be able to do is just stream of what could have been just like with prior versions of harvey dent because he does in fact do the right thing by sacrificing himself and the show kills him off well i guess that is ballsy in its own right to have a version of harvey dent that actually does in fact bite the dust and in doing so he is able to balance out his own scales of justice but I gotta be honest, it kind of t robs us of the potential of an anti-hero Harvey Dent, which I think would have been much cooler. That coupled with the fact that he wasn't doing the whole us, we thing, he wasn't constantly flipping coins, he wasn't altering his voice all that much, he would gravel it just a little bit, but Daedric Bader, again, played it very nuanced in a way where it's like, okay, he's not instantly going black and white between the voices where it's looking super smooth, but they're like that. Nothing like Troy Baker did with uh, Arkham City, which is not a bad thing. It kind of worked for what you were doing in that game. But here, it was a much fresher take that I was appreciating for a while and the way that they were kind of, like I said, developing the way that he talks and it's almost like he was trying to like box away the voice and maybe they were going to explore that voice a little bit further, explore that psyche a little bit stronger in season two. But now it just seems like we're never really going to know because the show legitimately kills him off. And in doing so, I feel like it fails Harvey Dent. But much like the show attempts to do with its final shot that kind of harkens back to those golden days of the animated series with the lightning striking, similar to... How it shows up right there with this Gargoyles mesh shirt. It's trying to give us the feeling that there is light in the darkness. With Batman standing amongst that light. And I personally feel like there's a little bit of that for a potential season 2. Because the way that this version of Batman comes across as far as, like I said, Hamish Linkslater's voice. His design for the 60s aesthetic while at the same time still having a few modernisms with the cowl, the way that he utilizes his cape, his fighting styles, how savage he sometimes kind of goes with the punching, I really do like. So when Batman is on screen, it is in fact Batman. I am having these little feelings inside of me that kind of starts to, to develop a little bit of a smile the way that I did back in 1992 and 93 when I was watching Batman the Animated Series. And the episodes where this version of Batman is mainly the primary character and it's solely focusing on him, which we did actually get a good batch of in the latter half of the season, where it was really Batman and Alfred going on their caped crusades. 
it was really awesome and it really did make me feel like I was watching the animated series Bruce Tim show in a way where I'm like yeah you know catch the gentleman knight or let's try to figure out what's going on with this little girl that's able to absorb energies and trying to figure out how to take care of these like orphans that are conveniently named uh, Kelly and and what was it uh, Jace Jason Dicky Dick and I knew exactly what they were doing there again kind of going back to what I was mentioning about references but it was really these episodes that made me go yeah there's potential here and if we could get more episodes like this I feel like we can have a much stronger season two and again I want to reiterate that when they are on screen the way that they were written and kind of developed Gordon Barbara and Montoya are actually still good in their own right to the point where I'm like why are they taking up the the screen time in a Batman show they should be in like a Gotham's finest show or uh, I don't know exactly what it would be titled, but something like what Fox was trying to do with Gotham, but in an animated style, because if this was like a show about Gotham's policemen or uh, police uh, men and women or their you know, force trying to weed out the corruption and whatnot prior to Batman's arrival, Montoya, this version of Barbara and Gordon would be perfect. They would fit right at home and I would legitimately watch the show and see exactly, you know, who's betraying who, you know, this this very boardwalk empire kind of approach, but in an animated style, mixing the 60s with modern in Gotham, that would have been perfect. But instead, it's called Batman the Cape Crusader. So you can't really sell us one thing and then go, ha, hooked you. It's, it, it, that's literally the definition of a bait and switch. So I'm hoping that maybe we can kind of rectify that in season two because when they're able to focus on Batman, the show really does in fact soar. And that doesn't even mean that you need to necessarily ground it. You can still bring in those fantastical elements like Natalia, the girl that was kind of sucking the energy out of her victims. I actually really did enjoy that they didn't kill her off. She kind of had like this complex tragedy about her, the way that... Harvey Dent maybe could have had and ultimately it failed so I was digging what they were doing with Natalia and how the tragedy happened with her brother and the fact that they didn't kill her off makes me go okay I actually would not mind seeing her in season two and the way that they kind of planted things of course very difficult for any Batman property to not tackle the Joker eventually but it does look like much like with the rest of the Rogue Gallery villains which I still would like to see some kind of either return or something that again I enjoyed out of this be kind of replicated or done in a similar fashion like the way that they did with the uh, Clayface episode or the Gentleman Knight etc. The way that they're tackling Joker here in a way where it's almost like a very mad science type where he's not super chaotic and he's not just laughing. Because you hear the laughing and you think it's him, but it's actually his victims. And this version of the Joker is going to be a bit more, you know, brooding, a bit obviously darker, but he's got the deeper voice. So they're going with something that's a bit more on the malevolent, super serious side. And frankly think they can maybe make that work if you get the right talent behind it focus focus on the talent and not much else I'll leave it at that don't focus on trying to check boxes trying to please everyone right now like I said certain reports in terms of gross in terms of selling units in terms of viewership all that stuff is speaking and if we want to make sure that the viewership for a show with great potential like Batman Cape Crusader can really exceed on a much better season two, then focus on the talent and focus on the stories. Like I said, the stuff with Natalia worked, the stuff with uh, Batman when he's the main focal point really works. And some of the writing is still well done as far as making sure that you got a really good show that's PG-13 style, but at the same time taking what really worked out of the animated series and bringing it on over here. Like I said before, it felt like eating a well-seasoned and very tasty crab cake that later on you find out had some imitation crab in it. But you recognize that there was enough talent behind that chef to season it properly and cook it all the way through that it didn't make you sick. So you think to yourself, well, I was disappointed that you had to resort to imitation crab meat or you made a really great pasta dish but you used bottled uh, store-bought tomato sauce. But... The way you cook those noodles and the way you season them and added that stuff on top, I can tell that's very hard to come by. So why? how about with the right amount of time and the right amount of direction and focus on talent and focus on the right ingredients, let's cook that tomato sauce from scratch. Let's actually 
buy natural crabs. You know, boil them, cook them properly, and make a much better crab cake or uh, pasta dish that I know you can make. And I feel like that's what we can really need to take away from a potential season two of Batman the Caped Crusader. What do you guys think of this direction? Do you think that you they did Harvey Dent Two-Face justice, pun intended, in Batman the Caped Crusader? Or do you think they tackled it from a completely different angle that maybe didn't in fact pan out? Did you enjoy this version of the characters? Did you overall like the show from a very you know subjective stance? Like just from pure enjoyment, did you like what they did with Caped Crusader? Or do you think that they could have done better? And what are your expectations for a season two? What are certain characters outside of, of course, the inevitable turn on Joker? What's other characters that you would like to see pop up on an animated version of the Batman cartoon that's really done right and has that Bruce Tim aesthetic while at the same time going its own direction? Let me know down below. If you guys enjoyed the video, hit the thumbs up button. If not, hit the thumbs down. As always, big thanks to over our executive producers over at the level two tier, Tom Bowling. And you guys know what to do. Stay humble, and I'll see you guys later.